A San Diego deputy is under investigation tonight after allegations from six women of sexual misconduct. And sexual misconduct allegations take down two more media giants today, while national and state lawmakers try to tackle the issue within their own ranks. Open space is the first thing you think about in a site plan, not the last thing. And what an expanded San Diego State campus could look like. Coming up, KPBS Evening Edition starts right now. Good evening and thanks for joining us. I'm Ebony Monet. At least six women have accused a San Diego County Sheriff's deputy of sexual misconduct. KPBS investigative reporter Amitha Sharma has more. The department has opened a criminal probe into allegations that Deputy Richard Fisher was sexually inappropriate with women during arrests, welfare checks, and a burglary investigation. A sheriff's spokesman said, quote, allegations of this nature are taken very seriously. He said the investigation was launched after a first allegation surfaced last month. But one of Fisher's accusers, identified as KP in a lawsuit, said she first notified the department about Fisher in March 2016 after he arrested her for drug possession. When he searched me, he searched me very long and inappropriately. He put his hand in between my legs and rubbed all the way up my leg. Um, he put his hands in my sweatshirt, but on top of my t-shirt and was like rubbing my back and down the sides of my, um, my torso. Um, he, when he took my seatbelt off, he, gro he groped my breasts and pulled his arm all the way across them. She alleges he told her just moments earlier, quote, I hope I'm not making you uncomfortable. If I accidentally cop a feel, it's an accident. The department has placed Fisher on administrative assignment as its investigation continues. Attorney Dan Gillian, who is representing six accusers, said he's not surprised that Fisher has not been arrested yet. Everyone asks the police to police their own, you know, to, but they don't. What they do is they protect their own. KPBS reached out to Fisher but did not hear back. Amitha Sharma, KPBS News. Members of Congress are tackling the issue of sexual misconduct. Today, they voted to make sexual harassment training for lawmakers mandatory. Zero tolerance means consequences for everyone. No matter your contribution to our country, you do not get a pass to harass or discriminate. No matter how great the legacy, it is not a license to harass or abuse. To the victims of harassment and abuse, we hear you, we believe you, we are here for you. Representative Susan Davis spoke to KPBS Midday Edition host Maureen Cavanaugh moments before the vote. Davis touched on recent sexual harassment allegations against Congressman John Conyers and Senator Al Franken, saying the lawmakers deserve a day before the ethics committees and Congress should take a firm zero tolerance stance. Do you think that training like that will make a significant difference? Well, it's a start. I don't think that the training in and of itself is going to change culture. Uh, that's what we're dealing with here as we are in the country, as we were in the military, continue to be in the military, and certainly on our university campuses and, and really throughout, throughout society on many levels. But it is helpful for people to know the rules and for it to be very clear to staffers and to Im, Im, the members themselves um, that no behavior that puts people in untenable positions and that makes them very uncomfortable, unable to do their work, uh, harasses them in any way is acceptable. At the state capitol, a Democratic lawmaker is criticizing how state officials are handling sexual harassment lawsuits. He's urging his fellow colleagues to get tough on holding proven violators accountable for their actions. The taxpayers are stuck with the bill. We never go after the violator. And so I think we should change the dynamic. We shouldn't limit uh, individuals' uh, rights to, to go and get a pay out, payout. Because you know, if they were harmed in the workplace, you know, good, good for them for getting justice on, for, on their own sake. 
But we as taxpayers should say, hey, individual who caused harm over here, maybe we should get you to reimburse us, the taxpayer. One lawmaker has already stepped down amid misconduct allegations. In the media sector, two big names are also out. Garrison Keeler, former host of A Prairie Home Companion, and Matt Lauer from The Today Show were both fired today following out allegations of improper behavior. Keeler retired from his show last year but was still employed by Minnesota Public Radio where he had worked since 1969. Neither NPR nor Keeler has released details about the allegations. Good morning, breaking news overnight. Matt Lauer has been terminated from NBC News. Matt Lauer was fired for what NBC said was inappropriate sexual behavior that violated company standards. The company says it was the first complaint against the longtime anchor, but there was reason to believe it wasn't an isolated incident. Lauer becomes the second morning host in a week to lose his job over sexual misconduct allegations. CBS fired Charlie Rose after several women who worked for him complained about his behavior. At NPR, another senior editor at, has stepped down following allegations of sexual misconduct. David Sweeney was chief news editor. NPR reports his departure follows a, former inter, a formal internal review by the organization after three current and former NPR journalists filed complaints against him. Earlier this month, NPR's senior vice president of news was also forced to resign over sexual misconduct allegations. Our coverage continues on air and online at kpbs.org and we'll have more analysis on PBS NewsHour starting at 7. Today, San Diego State University officials shared a $3 billion plan that would reshape the Mission Valley Stadium site currently owned by the city of San Diego. KPBS reporter Eric Anderson has details. The university's vision for the site was flushed out thanks to the architectural firm Carrier Johnson. Gordon Carrier says he was approached with the task of designing a college campus that fits naturally in the Mission Valley Stadium space. Open space is the first thing you think about in a site plan, not the last thing. That turned into natural and recreation space on the eastern and southern edges of the site, which sits lower than the main project area. That would allow for seasonal flooding. Carrier says a large slice of the existing parking lot would be raised to allow for construction of an expandable stadium 4,500 housing units, hotel space, and some retail space. We believe that this project has the capacity to create an immensely interesting development on the upland, never rejecting the fact that open space needs to be the priority for a great project. Parking would be underground or integrated into the buildings. The conceptual drawings show buildings that share Spanish colonial design traits with major structures on the school's main campus. There's a clock tower in the heart of the campus area, tree-lined streets that serve as a gateway, and enough commercial space to serve the site's residents. JMI Realty's John Kratzner says there is major work required once officials put the first shovel into the ground. Hydrology, flooding issues, water issues, that has to happen on the front end. There's very significant utility work that's got to be done on the site. Kratzner anticipates the project would come about in phases. He says building a stadium for the Aztec football team is a priority that needs to be worked on quickly. The first phase will involve uh, the river park, the community parks that you saw, uh, the stadium, potentially uh, an early residential site and potentially an early innovation hub uh, or campus site. Uh, we anticipate uh, the full development to take 15 years. Uh, obviously, that will be influenced by market conditions, but we think it could be accomplished in as few as 15 years. San Diego State University President Sally Rouse says the design meets the university's long-term plans to expand beyond its 283-acre campus on the Montezuma Mesa. She says SDSU West can be built without taxpayer dollars. We talk a lot every day about whether or not there should be more of a state or public investment in the university itself. Um, uh, the, we don't make the decisions about how much is invested by the state of California and the university. We work with the outcome of that. So perhaps there should be, but we won't count on it. We'll um, be prepared to move forward with a plan that um, we're confident can be self-financed.
Roush says the land in the campus portion of the project could be sold to a developer, improved, and then the structures could be rented to the school until the builder recoups their investment. Once that happens, the university would take control of those buildings. Roush says those types of private-public partnerships can be used to finance everything at the site but the stadium. That will be paid for with $250 million in revenue bonds. Roush says no public money will be needed, and the city of San Diego will benefit from the sale of the land at fair market value. There will also be tax revenue generated at the site. We're hiring a firm in the next few weeks here to actually do some calculations so we can put a number to that. The whole project relies on voter approval of an initiative that hasn't qualified for the ballot yet. Friends of SDSU are in the process of gathering signatures for a measure that allows the city to sell the land and development rights to the school. Rival FS Investors has already qualified a measure for next November's ballot. It seeks to build housing, commercial space, a river park, and a sports stadium as part of an effort to bring a major league soccer franchise to the city. FS Investors say the SDSU plan is virtually the same as theirs, but the SDSU plan offers no binding commitments and could cost taxpayers hundreds of millions of dollars. Eric Anderson, KPBS News. A $100 million project to restore a San Diego coastal lagoon broke ground today. KPBS North County reporter Allison St. John says the restoration will do more than restore the natural habitat. It will prepare the lagoon for sea level rise. The San Alijo Lagoon is an oasis of calm between Encinitas and Solana Beach. It's home to many species of fish and birds, including endangered species. It's surrounded by construction at the moment because Caltrans is rebuilding bridges to widen Interstate 5 and add a second track to the railway line. San Diego's coastal wetlands, like this San Alijo Lagoon, are disappearing under pressure from development. It'll cost more than $100 million to renovate this lagoon. And the funding is coming from mitigation money from the multi-billion dollar North Coast Corridor Project, which is expanding I-5 and the rail line. Many agencies gathered for the groundbreaking, which has been coordinated by Caltrans. Doug Gibson of the San Alijo Lagoon Conservancy says historically the lagoon was used for dumping and the old bridges under the freeway and the railway line have affected the lagoon's ability to flush itself. That increases bacteria and so we start to have this decrease in water quality um, that affects the fish species, the invertebrate population uh, that can survive in the lagoon. What that affects are the birds and sort of everything else. So it's this cascading effect. Gibson says changing the configuration of the bridges over the lagoon and dredging out sediment will make the lagoon healthier. A unique aspect of the plan is that it'll build contoured basins and islands so when sea level rise hits the coast in coming decades, the marshy wetlands won't be wiped out. The problem is we have a lot of lagoons that are more bowl-shaped and so as sea level rises, that habitat becomes this small ring around the bathtub. So th we know that species are going to be impacted and, and we're trying to give them the best chance they can in the future. The work on the lagoon and the bridges across it is projected to be done by 2021. Allison St. John, KPBS News. San Diego County health leaders are actively working to stop the spread of hepatitis A. Now Claremont High School students are putting their heads together to develop new ways to end the outbreak. Outbreak. KPBS education reporter Megan Berg says it's part of San Diego Unified's efforts to connect students to the region's biotech sector. We're here at Biolab San Diego. It's a lab and co-working space where biotech entrepreneurs can come and try to get their companies off the ground. Now, all week, students from Claremont High School are visiting to learn about the biotech industry and to also get first-hand experience pitching ideas to investors. Now, here's the thing. Everything about today is based in the real world. So the ideas that students are pitching are about how to stop the spread of hepatitis A in San Diego. Our idea is to make a movable, movable car where it includes new, new tents, new clothing, cleaning materials, sexual protection, uh, and vaccinations. So we're preventing that with recycled gloves that you can get every time uh, you go to a gym workout. We came up with the idea of plates with a purpose. So our plates would be a packaged meal, just food that really would help somebody with hepatitis diet. Yeah, I think this is a very unique place. Uh, to, to know this is going to help me a lot in the future. 
because my MMSL wants to be an entrepreneur. Working through this entire plan step by step with everything covering everything like cost, um, partnerships, just everything for a real company and just a real plan, it's really cool. So I definitely think we could use it after high school. BioLab San Diego will be hosting Claremont students in the Health and Business Academies through the rest of the week. That means about 144 students served. Reporting from La Jolla, Megan Burks, KPBS News. I'm Judy Woodruff. Tonight on the news, our President Trump vows new sanctions on North Korea after their latest missile test. Coming up at 7, right after Evening Edition on KPBS. A mild and sunny day in San Diego with the possibility of showers later this week. Brittany Boyer has tonight's forecast. Hopefully everyone had a great Wednesday. We have another beautiful day on the way for tomorrow. Sunshine, nice temperatures, actually a couple degrees above normal for this time of year. And we're staying pretty dry. We had a lot of high level clouds today. While well, the moisture is going to stay to our north over Northern California, also up toward Washington and Oregon. But the last couple of hours, you can see we've had those high level clouds with that moisture to our south pushing into Arizona. So today, a pretty decent day and tomorrow is also looking good as well. So a closer inspection for you here showing the dry conditions, just those high level clouds tonight. We'll call it partly cloudy with lows in the mid 50s. So good sleeping weather tonight. Uh, as you get a little bit farther inland here, we're looking at a low 43 in Ramona, Alpine 46 and Mount Laguna low temperatures tonight in the low 40s. The setup for tomorrow, well, the dry weather continues. We've had less than a tenth of an inch of rain so far this month. We typically have around an inch or so for the month of November. So it's been very dry lately, dry and also mild. Here's a look at some of the temperatures as we head into your Thursday out toward Oceanside, a high of 70 degrees. San Diego near 70. We should be at about 67 this time of the year. So temperatures are just running a touch above normal right now. Let's break it down for you with the extended forecast here. Starting off at the coast, you'll notice next several days, temperatures will be staying in the low 70s here at night. Our lows are going to be in the 40s. So again, that active storm track is staying to our north, so not getting any moisture at the coast. Inland we go. Look at these temperatures. Next couple of days, upper 70s. As we get toward the end of the weekend and early next week, you'll notice that we do cool off just a touch here with highs in the low 70s by Sunday and also Monday. Out in the mountains also looking at some nice weather here. A little bit breezy at times, but still staying nice and dry. Lows in the 40s and 30s. Daytime highs in the 60s and also heading into next week, a big cool down on the way by Monday with highs only in the 40s. We'll also see that cool down in the desert, but up until then, expect those warmer than normal temperatures with highs in the upper 70s and 80s. For KPBS, I'm Brittany Boyer. The Radium Girls got sick from work, so you don't have to. Marketplace producer David Brancaccio and Katie Long show us how these American workers fought for regulations and made the workplace safe for millions. These women were known as the worker ghosts, which is very eerie. They found that the women's bones were honeycombed and moth-eaten, so holes had been made in these women's bones while they were still alive. They could not be saved, and yet they were determined to protect all other workers. The Radium Girls were the American women from the First World War who used to paint numbers on watches and dials with a luminous radium paint that glowed in the dark. And these women were taught to put their brushes laden with radium paint between their lips to make a fine point for the delicate handiwork. And in so doing, the women were swallowing that radium. They were starting to experience very odd illnesses pain in their jaw. They started to get tumors. Yet there wasn't a name for what they were experiencing. When the women started bringing it to their employer's attention that it was so dangerous, the company did not want to believe what the women were saying, and therefore they discredited them. They would hire their own scientists who would produce the data they wanted to use to represent radium as safe. Radium at that time was seen as a wonder element. People drank it not only to cure illness, but actually to ward off ill health. And so the hardest thing 
was to find someone who would diagnose an illness that was actually linked to radium and acknowledge that it came from a workplace. They were determined to hold the company to account for hurting them, literally with their dying breath. Through the Women's Labor Network, they were trying to do research of their own to determine what is safe and having their own information that they could actually bring to the government in order to be able to create regulations. It was one of the very first cases in which an employer was held responsible for the health of its employees. And so it lays the groundwork for organizations like OSHA that will eventually protect many millions of other workers. We should look at the story as a model of collective action. They sought out experts who could help them gather what they needed in order to define what is health on the job. They used that death sentence to give themselves a new way to life, a life that came through their legal legacy. And I just think that is extraordinary. Serving up ice cream in a unique way. And this museum has locations in San Francisco and Los Angeles. KQED reporter Shiraz Sadiq takes us on this sweet journey. We wanted to create a space that brought people together. This is a space that is unifying, it's a safe space, it's empowering, and ice cream is such a beloved treat that it just felt like the perfect combination. This isn't your typical museum where the artwork is behind a place of glass. Here the artwork is meant to be touched, interacted with. Why did you take such an unconventional approach to the design of your museum? Well, I find that museums can be a little bit isolating, right? There's this sense that you can't touch anything, you're going to break something. And I think when you have that level of degree of constriction, it limits people from truly being able to express themselves. So we wanted to create a space where people could really be their authentic selves. They could laugh, they could have fun, they could touch something and nothing would break. It's flipping this concept of the traditional museum on its head. It's also a museum that's tailor-made for millennials and their love of Snapchat and Instagram. How did social media influence your design aesthetics and your choices? It wasn't so much Instagram or Snapchat or Facebook that led the aesthetic design behind this, more so this, this sense of capturing the moment and what could we do from a design perspective that really allowed people to transport back. And we feel that the more visual the space is, the more people are able to do so. The Museum of Ice Cream features nine different themed rooms, including a gummy bear garden, rock candy cave, and the main attraction, wow. a swimming pool filled with plastic sprinkles. Oh, raining sprinkles! There's just something so therapeutic, and it really, they do, we made sure they would look as real as they do. They look like real sprinkles. How many sprinkles are in this thing, roughly 100 speaking? million sprinkles. Wow. Yeah. After using an air hose to remove all the sprinkles sticking to my clothes, Madison took me to meet Grant, a gold-horned unicorn standing tall in a field of rainbows. My favorite room here is our rainbow room. It's an homage to San Francisco for the pride and inclusivity and diversity that this city has fostered and created for its entire existence. Inclusivity and making sure that all people feel safe and protected in this space is a huge mission statement of ours and something that we strongly value. Thank you. Dipped in real madness. But no trip to a museum for ice cream would be complete without delicious reminders of why this timeless treat never goes out of style, even after a makeover from millennials. All right, welcome to Mary Steiner. Oh my God, this is amazing. <laughs> I've like stepped into a 50s diner. Yeah, exactly, that's the intention behind it. So it's also our scoop of the month room. What you have in front of you here is ginger snap flavored ice cream with a gingerbread crumble on top with some sprinkles. And then we're gonna add this lovely strawberry basil sauce. We wanna make sure that this city feels that we are working in collaboration with ice cream creameries that have been around for a while. So each month we have a ice cream shop from San Francisco that's created a unique flavor that you can only get at the Museum of Ice Cream. <laughs> that is the bomb. That's the Best answer we want, yeah. yeah. <laughs> At the Museum of Ice Cream, you won't encounter artwork that's overtly political, but you can still express your opinion, even a political one, in the message statement room. 
we wanted to create a space where people could take their emotions and how they felt and make a statement on the walls. We believe that this is an equalizing space. This is an opportunity for you to feel your authentic self. And if you have something to say that maybe is political or maybe is socially oriented, feel free to say it. Maybe our universal love for ice cream springs from memories of what it was like to be a kid when your toughest decision was deciding what kind of scoop to get. Or maybe it's because we associate sharing a cone with friends and family in times of celebration, just as Tisha Daniel and her family were doing when I caught up with them at the museum. I love it. It's phenomenal. It's more than I ever imagined. We're celebrating my daughter's first birthday today, and so I'm excited to show her these pictures when she grows up and let her know that you went to a place that not everybody gets to go to. I think ice cream brings happiness. Like, who eats ice cream and is sad? Ready? It's fun, whether it's soft serve or you know, out of a tub or whatever, it's fun. Feels good. We have people from cultures from all over the world who are coming together and talking with somebody they probably never would have had the opportunity to speak with. And they're talking about ice cream and they're having fun. When you see the power of human connection in such a simplified form, I think it can be a great example of how we should move forward as a country. The Museum of Ice Cream in Los Angeles is open through the end of this month, and the next one opens in Miami. You can find tonight's stories on our website, kpbs.org slash evening edition. Thanks for joining us. Have a great night.